Thank you so much. So uh, sorry about delay, but let me start. Hey, everyone. Uh, today I'm really happy to share this iceberg focus data quality talk with you. And yesterday uh, we had uh, similar sessions about uh, how we're using the various Apache project to help build uh, scalable data pipelines uh, with cell service to Jupyter Notebooks. Today uh, we're going to focus on the data quality piece. My colleague uh, Luciano here, uh, we're going to present you uh, more in details. So I'll start with some uh, definitions. I'll also talk about one of the story from NASA's, how data quality will impact them, and say about iceberg, uh, what do they support on the data quality piece. And uh, Luciano will take over the second half on how we develop and schedule such airflow, uh, such data quality check on the airflow. So let's jump in. When we talk about data qualities, what are they, and why is that important? Start with something we're all familiar with, the Apache project, right? So all of this uh, we saw, we will have these code quality problems uh, in the project, and I think data quality problem is kind of similar, that sometimes we will have a wrong encapsulations, we'll have a lot of uh, loop controls, uh, which eventually will increase a lot of um, mental burden of developers and slow down our development process. And in a fairly complex system where we have a lot of uh, data to be handled with, eventually we might have some problems um, will result into the production failures or incidents. So similarly, I, I believe that uh, we can also have this uh, data quality problems. And in my own personal observations, I think the data quality problems are much harder to detect and it's more difficult to fix. So I believe everyone who works with the data long enough will know that data quality, data quality problem actually is ubiquitous and uh, uh, we have to really think about why do they come, right? So I think there's a few reasons I can think about. The first one is about the data, how we get these data. Nowadays, uh, we have various of the data source. We can get data from the device IDs. Uh, we can get from different sensor or third party vendors, which means a lot of data we don't have a strong control with. And we cannot assume on it's when the data will arrive in our system. Sometimes data can be late. Other times data can be completely lost. So the second part is that we have this uh, keep we always have a new requirements, business requirement, ask us to update our table schemas. Maybe we will want to add some new feature flags or add more data to be collected. So in, the, in this data lake, usually all of this raw data is being ingested. Uh, they don't validate the uh, schema on the right so that later the data consumer will try to figure out what's the right schema to read the data. Oftentimes we'll see, hey, when we're trying to add a new features, but all of the data required for these features is missing, or we have a high percentage of new value in those columns. And thirdly, I think there's a lot of problem on the semantic layers, whereas uh, sometimes the data will outlive the system or the system to handle such data. The original developer right? this system might already left the companies. So through the exchange of ownership, we realized that this data semantic are actually uh, slowly de deteriorating, which means maybe for the same data, we will have more than one interpretation about these data. So all of this can lead to a problem, which is we cannot trust our data to make these uh, business critical decisions. So let's look at some actual examples. So back in the 1990s, NASA are trying to start in Mars. So they actually designed this called uh, Mars Climate Orbiters. So this is supposed to be used as a communication relays and while circling around the Mars orbiting. And it can uh, send all these uh, data we collect on the ground, like Mars polar landers or deep space probes, sent back to the Earth. So the design was conducted by the uh, Jet Propulsion Labs or GPLs. And the contractor or manufacturer is U.S. Uh, uh, Lockheed Martins. So the overall mission actually end up uh, in uh, failures because of navigation errors. The orbiter didn't really get to theirs and burned up on the Mars atmospheres. 
And later on, we will reveal that the problem is actually because of the units. The GPL, lots of scientists, they designed this using this uh, international uh, metrics. So it's more about newtons, kilograms, meters, where the Lockheed Martin as a U.S. suppliers, they supply the unit in the U.S. customary unit, so foot, pound, and seconds. So even though the exact number might be right, because we have a different understanding of the numbers, it ends up uh, costs NASA $125 million in the $1999. And it's also unfortunate that orbiter actually traveled 400 plus million miles in the nine months, but it didn't even arrive on the Mars uh, uh, orbit. So how do we prevent such problem from happening again? So I think something we can use commonly is called the data quality check. It's a way for us to guard against our data to make sure our assumptions stay true for our data. And uh, this is actually uh, important because over the past decades, our tech technology advanced a lot so that we can use the commodity hardware to store and compute uh, so we can collect more data. And, uh, but when we're trying to uh, think about how we ensure this data is of high qualities, I don't think we have spent enough time or effort to protect our data. So we realize that in, in data intensive application or systems, when bad data enter the systems, actually it will propagate, it will pollute all the downstreams, and uh, it will cause more trouble if the time goes on. So that uh, if it's possible, we can, we, we probably want to try to catch a problem as soon as possible in the upstream so that, um, and we can set up some uh, continuous alerts so that we are stay on top of our data. So let's talk about the actual um, Apache ISOR project. To those who are not familiar, it's a table format so that uh, it can bring the asset guarantee to the underlying data sets. Uh, Iceberg send out, it works very well with this uh, uh, data at scales. It can manage terabytes or petabytes of data, but still answer a lot of queries in seconds. And the reason why it can do that is that um, it stores a lot of uh, uh, metadata in the hierarchical architectures. So they, when they're trying to read the data, they can skip a lot of data files instead of uh, reading every single data files. I believe yesterday Anton has a really great talk about iceberg scan plannings. He explained a lot of things in details and provided benchmark results to see how iceberg perform against uh, 50 million of, uh, files. At very high level, I believe the data being written to the tables uh, we are collecting a lot of the metrics and we store them in the metadata. For example, for the, um, all of the columns we have, we store its uh, mean and max values. Those can be used to uh, skip a lot of data files when we have the query. And also uh, we store some new value counts and also the column size. This helps us to optimize our scanning. Those metrics are not only to speed up the reads, but also it uh, can be helpful when we're trying to uh, check the data quality because a lot of the metrics are essential. So metric aside, uh, Iceberg provides this uh, data quality pattern called the Write Audit Publish, or WAP for short. So basically a three-step process. Uh, first we write the data, then we generate metadata and generate a new snapshots. Lastly, we publish this uh, snapshot once we verify the uh, data quality checks. So that I think the problem they're trying to solve is that they basically separate the piece where when we're trying to write the data and the data is visible to everyone else. So WAP um, ingests this second step in between so that we can make sure we only publish the data once we have the enough confidence. So let's look at some real data. Um, back in 2015, I believe New York City published a lot of uh, data uh, as part of their open data initiative. I'll use one of them for my examples. So this one is about uh, conducting the tree census for all of the trees in the New York City streets. 
uh, the their park and recreational department actually conduct some uh, uh, research so that they ask off their stuff and volunteer for checking total of eight, 684,000 trees and collect all these uh, species precipitation of health and the location into a data set. Let's see how we can use WAP on top of those. So first, the first step is that we're writing this data into iceberg tables. Uh, when we write this data, let's say uh, the data format is parquet, we'll collect all this parquet uh, row group or files of partition level stats, and we store them into the iceberg tables. And uh, the second step is, once we have the metadata, we will generate new snapshots. And uh, we will mark this snapshot as the current in the catalog. So all of the future, write, uh, future reads will use these snapshots. But for WAP, it's a little bit differently. We don't set these snapshots as current immediately until we apply our data quality check. So that comes to the second, which is how we check this. Uh, before we do, let me look at actual stats collected by iceberg tables. So there's about four columns here. The first columns we have is a distinct value counts. It's kind of represent the dimensionality of the data. For example, um, if we check out the tree IDs, we have a really large uh, dimensionalities because every tree is supposed to have a unique IDs. And uh, if we're looking at the borrow, which is second last row, it will only have uh, five distinct values because in New York City, we only have a finite number of the district like Brooklyn and Manhattan we saw before. The second column is new fractions, uh, indicating percentage of new numbers in all of the rows. So everything else is good except the middle threes. Uh, we have roughly about 5% of the new values. And that means we probably need a second look to see and understand why. The last thing, the lower and higher bounds uh, just uh, are just being recorded for the numbered columns. So it's set as new for all of the string type because it doesn't make much sense to record this for the string. So zooming into these columns and look at actual data definitions, we realize that these three columns we're interested about, which is tree house or tree species names in the Latin and common names, they have some common. And for the house, they're saying that it's indicated of the user, user perception of the tree house. Those fields are intentional left as a blank if a tree is dead or it's a stump. So that kind of help explain why are we seeing the new values in the house columns. But we're not 100% sure about the species. I think one of the interpretation might be uh, the, the volunteer conduct this census just doesn't know what's the species corresponding to. But we have to make the decision based on the information available to us. So um, depends on how this data set are going to be used. If we ju just want to know the tree distribution by the city locations, we can keep this data as is. But if we're planning to see, hey, what kind of tree should we plant in the city for the next year, then we probably want to drop this because these uh, new values doesn't provide any uh, insight into that. So. From this, we can see we can make different decisions based on the uh, purpose, business purpose of the data sets. And uh, lastly, uh, on the published side. So if there are some problem with data qualities, for example, when we're trying to check a little bit further, we can pause and investigate to, uh, to decide what's the appropriate action for the data pipelines. As I showed previously, we can either drop them or keep them as is. But in, in the real world, this data quality check is a little bit more complex and more uh, time consuming. The good part is that uh, we only stop uh, for a subset of uh, uh, writes. All of the other uh, read of the iceberg table can continue while we're trying to figure out what's the right data quality check to apply. And uh, if let's say after the check has been passed, what we can do is just simply publish, so make this snapshot to visible to all of the downstream. And the good part is it's only a metadata operations. We don't need to touch any of the data files we just write. 
So that sounds really great. What's the catch? Uh, what about if there's other concurrent of op a right operation happens when you apply the data quality check? Would that uh, statement still hold true? So let's look at iceberg features. Um, I think they recently have this called the branch and tagging supports, which uh, partially allow us to apply the version control or get like semantic to our data sets. So it is kind of easy, based on the design of uh, Iceberg, to actually fork the writes. The, in such way, we can use that for the GDPR compliance and uh, retain particular snapshots. However, there may be other challenge when we're trying to merge this back. So what we currently support is that we can uh, publish the trend from stage WAP write to the master only if the change set is append or dynamic override. So for other scenario, like when we actually need to resolve the conflict, and this conflict is of a type of uh, row level operation, like an update or deletions, it is not currently supported. So next, um, I'm going to uh, let Luisano expand a little bit more on the Tory site. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we heard a lot about kind of like a strategies and, and, and things to do to quality check. Uh, but one thing that uh, uh, we realize is a lot of the process is sort of like a very interactive. You need to do a lot of like data exploration and so forth to kind of like understand the data that you have, understand what are the, 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 the quality uh, checks and things like that that you need to apply. Um, and the way we, we, we used to, well, the way we do with that is uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks provides you sort of like a, a very interactive approach to data exploration. And also we need to support uh, being able to process uh, very large data sets, uh, integrated maybe with Spark and other runtimes that, that provides the parallelism and the distribution that we need to uh, be able to uh, process large data sets. Uh, so Tori is uh, the kernel. Kernel is an abstraction for like a, uh, on Jupyter Notebooks to the, the script or the language that they support. Tori provides the support for Scala and the integration with Apache Spark, allowing you kind of like a data engineers to start uh, exploring the data, being able to identify the, the, what you need to apply to that and all of that. Uh, just a quick diagram for a better understanding. Uh, notebook, kind of like it gives you the, the UI. You can start uh, uh, exploring, uh, plotting the data, doing distributions, and, and understanding uh, all the details about the data that you have. Tori kind of is the middleware uh, that integrates and uh, allows you to um, get access to a Spark cluster, get access to all the Spark APIs, be able to do all the aggregations, queries, etc., so that you can identify all the, the work that needs to be done uh, on the data sets that you are exploring. Um, uh, once you are done, you, you have an understanding, you, you want to start productionalizing all that to not only the data that you have, but like all the data that are, are coming in and all the data that is being ingested. Y y Airflow starts to bring in all that kind of like uh, orchestration as we saw on the previous uh, uh, talk, allowing you to automate, schedule that maybe to uh, every, every hour or periodically as you need it. And then you can do all the ETLs, you can have uh, uh, even specific operators that does specific checks that you need and all of that, being able to automate all of the quality checks that you need. Uh, in terms of like uh, uh, quality checks, what are some of the important uh, uh, items or, or things that we need to check? So like for example, do we have missing or uh, impartial data? Uh, any uh, duplication data? Is it like uh, uh, out of bound data, stale data? All of that uh, anomaly in the source uh, that is a little bit more tricky to un un identify. But these are examples of all the things that we want to apply making sure uh, uh, the data has the quality that we need. 
And when we look, and this is an example of an operator that we have created, uh, you can uh, use that uh, as an example of like how you apply the data quality. Uh, because you are doing uh, things in the notebooks, you can also have a notebook to be the actual uh, uh, component that is checking the data. So you can uh, kind of like uh, use the uh, notebook that you are doing in development, uh, apply that and, and run that then for periodically checks that will basically identify and, and correct or, I, or, or flag uh, any items or, or issues that you will see on the data. So you, you have the flexibility. All of the different approaches are supported uh, into uh, Airflow and uh, either using Airflow operators that are like a paper mill operators for, for notebooks, scheduling, and, and things like that. Uh, in terms of like uh, putting them all together, uh, we can have like uh, different types of checks or different uh, um, kind of like uh, parts. Uh, we can start having like a, a sensor that does, uh, is using kind of like a partition sensor or signal sensor to identify uh, uh, data that is about to come. Uh, when you're writing, you can then run like a PySpark operator, Scala uh, operator, and you name it. Uh, you can then do audit checks uh, as well. So uh, uh, data quality operator, Jupyter Notebook operator, as I mentioned. And then during publish, you can have like uh, uh, signals that uh, maybe uh, I tell an operator or, or tell someone that is in a kind of like a, a on call that there are issues with the data. And then we can uh, identify the next steps based on uh, what we were discussing in the previous slides. Uh, having said all of that, there are still uh, other areas that kind of like uh, uh, we need to identify. Uh, there's always subsets of the problems where we cannot anticipate and or kind of like a, uh, uh, might slip through all this check. So we, we want to know the data, li data lineage uh, and understand kind of like a, uh, uh, the process for tracking uh, like when the data come, when it was modified, where it was modified, all of that to help us understand any uh, issues that is slipped through the data quality checks. So uh, uh, that is another thing to have in mind and, and be able to process uh, throughout your data quality checks. Uh, I think that gives a, a kind of like a high level uh, uh, steps or, or high level areas that you need to identify and, and how you can start implementing that uh, using uh, notebooks, Tori, uh, Spark, and Airflow. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, both of us are um, available, and uh, we can uh, help uh, happily answer any of the questions that you have. Okay.